Hello and welcome to Analyzing Finance with Nick. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the country of France, which, depending on your views of the country, is one of the more controversial entries in this series. People either seem to love France and see it as a bright example of European leadership or hate it and see it as a symbol of economic and cultural decadence and the consequences of laziness in a society. Which one of these narratives is true? I'm going to investigate that in this video. First, let's start with what France does well. France has a strong cultural and imperial legacy. They built a global empire, and because of that, French is one of the dominant languages in the world. It is spoken in the Caribbean in many parts. It is spoken in, French, in Quebec, in North America, and throughout Africa, particularly West Africa. And there's even remnants of the French language in parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, France was also a leading example of arts and culture up until, say, the 1960s and 70s. Uh, French food is still known as being some of the best in the world and an example of cuisine for other countries. So they have a, built a, generations of political, economic, and cultural capital uh, over the past several centuries, which has really helped them. Uh, the other thing is that France is a fairly self-sufficient country, even though it's part of the EU. Uh, they are a dominant agriculture industry. They also have a self-sufficiency when it comes to energy production, at least for electricity. They do import oil. However, 40% of their imports are from Norway, and they have limited exposure to Russia and the Middle East compared to other European nations. But in terms of electricity generation, they have become a leader in renewable energy and domestically sourced energy because France doesn't really have its own oil reserves. There are some shale deposits in northern France, but they have not been exploited due to environmental concerns. But as in 2019, 72% of its power is generated by nuclear power plants, 7% uh, natural gas, and uh, the remaining is renewables such as hydroelectric power, solar, and wind. Uh, so that's a strong start from a geopolitical and also an economic perspective because they're not going to get squeezed as hard by shortages in the international energy market as some of their neighbors, such as Germany. Uh, France has a strong tradition of engineering, technology, and mathematics, especially within the military industrial complex. Uh, France is the headquarters of companies such as Dassault and uh, Airbus. And I just noticed like when I've worked on a trading desk and I've met a lot of quants and people work at quant hedge funds, there's four countries that are the most common to see quants from on a trading desk. The money that you'd be expect, India, China, just due to their high populations and their cultures valuing mathematical education. Russia is also known for having a lot of quants in the investment world. But the one that really surprised me is France. Uh, France is one of the leading countries in terms of educating its population in math. Some of the greatest mathematicians in history and in present day have come from France. And pretty much every quant desk that I've gotten to know people extensively at, at least one French quant on their team. And that has a lot of implications in terms of the country's ability to innovate technologically and to develop advanced uh, machinery, advanced weaponry, have an advanced financial economy, etc. There's a lot of trickle down effects for having a strong STEM culture. France is the number one tourist destination in the world, and it's eighth in terms of value added in manufacturing. Uh, France is an export powerhouse. They make a lot of specialty equipment, and they also draw people from around the world who like French culture 
and a lot of the historical sites, good food and favorable climate and things to do. I mean, I've been to France three times in my life. And even though I may not be a fan of some way they run their country politically, I always have a great time there uh, from a tourist perspective. Uh, Paris is a relatively competitive metro and uncompetitive neighborhood, which is continental Europe. Paris ranks number one in terms of multinational presence and in terms of its ability to attract talent in the region and it's just the size of its economy and the scope of its economy. The last main strength for France is its strong multinational corporate empire. France has many global multinationals that expand its influence well beyond what you think it would be on a basic level. Uh, notable companies that really stood out to me among the top French companies include Carrefour, which is basically the European version of Walmart. You have Renault, which is a major auto company that holds a big stake in Nissan, but its own branded cars are quite popular in Europe and Africa. Uh, they have the luxury brands Hermès and LVMH Group, which owns Louis Vuitton and is the largest luxury goods and accessories company in the world. They have Airbus, which is Europe's main competitor to Boeing in terms of commercial aviation aircraft manufacturing. Total, which is one of the global big oil com um, companies. Uh, them, Any, and BP and Shell are the four European uh, companies that fit the global oil major category. They have the leading biotech firm Sanofi uh, in their portfolio. A major world food processor, Danone. More the its brand is Danon without the E in the United States. Uh, you probably don't know my American the viewers for their yogurt, but they are a diverse food processing company around the world. You have Publicis Group, which is one of the first uh, marketing and advertising agencies in the history of the world and is now the fourth leading PR agency in the world to this day. Uh, L'Oreal is a major French brand of cosmetics. Michelin is a major French tire brand and it's globally popular. And then last but not least is Veolia, which is an environmental waste disposal company that's also a leader in water purification. So as you can see, the, the industry diversity among France's leading companies is something that is a sign of strength and resiliency and how France was able to make such a strong multinational presence was really thanks to the coattails of the Second French Empire. Uh, at its peak, the Second French Empire included most of North and West Africa, uh, had several islands in the Caribbean, and uh, in Polynesia, which they still control today, uh, French Indochina, a few colony cities in India and Madagascar and Syria and Lebanon was with the second, the first French empire included French North America, but that was lost in the 1760s. Uh, this allowed for the distribution of the French language well beyond Europe. And it provided captive markets for French multinationals to develop a global presence. And unlike many other European countries, such as the UK and Spain and Portugal, uh, and Portugal actually was kind of like France, is that they tried to hold off decolonization as long as possible. France never really truly fully decolonized. In fact, French Guiana in, in South America is still part of France and is the EU's main space testing center. They still control French Polynesia as well. And a lot of those islands such as Tahiti and Bora Bora are some of France's most popular tourist destinations to this day. Outside of the stuff they still directly control, the French imperial legacy is still looming large in West Africa. So you can see the map on the left was the French colonial empire in Northern and Western Africa. 
And the map on the right is the countries that use the CFA franc, which is the currency that is standard across the region and pegged to the euro. Uh, the use of this currency provides a lot of privileges to France, uh, such as the fact that the foreign reserves of these country central banks are actually stored in French banks. France gets favorable terms of trade, and they are still heavily involved in the local economies and geopolitics of these regions. Like, in fact, many of the former dictators of these countries, if they had gotten ousted, often retired in France itself. And France still has a large sway here. And if you look at really the only countries that didn't that broke off completely were Morocco, Algeria, Djibouti, and Mauritania, and Guinea. Uh, but Guinea-Bissau, which was a former Portuguese colony, joined the CFA franc zone. So France has also relies on these regions for a lot of raw material imports and again, captive markets for a lot of their manufactured goods. So why is France struggling if they seem to have a lot of things going well for them? Well, I think that really the challenge for France is that they've been living off of their own laurels. You can argue that France peaked under Louis the Fourteenth in the sixteen and seventeen hundreds, uh, or even like in the Napoleonic era, if you want to go a little later. But definitely by nineteen forty-five, France was starting to draw down on its capital more than accumulate geopolitical and cultural capital. I mean, a good way to actually kind of look at France is an old money family or a retiree or a trust fund kid who has more than enough to take care of themselves but if they keep but if they keep going the way that they're going right now their kids and grandkids may become genteel poverty a state of genteel poverty like that's kind of what France reminds me. It's like an old money person's living a little too high on the hog for their standards, and the family's not as wealthy as they were in previous generations. And you could kind of see that in a lot of ways with France. First, France is really the post World War II has adopted a work to live, not live to work type culture. They work the least amount of hours per year of any European country, and they rank 37th out of 38 OECD countries in terms of total hours worked in a year. Strikes are very common. Uh, people taking long lunches or just not really doing much when they're at the office is a real problem. A lot of American businesses who try to put European corporate headquarters or factories in France are heavily dismayed by the work culture there. And it shows that kind of France is again, resting on its old laurels because they've been a very wealthy and powerful country for so long. They don't really feel that they're at risk of losing it. Uh, France has a very bloated social welfare state and high tax burden, which I'm going to elaborate into later in this video. Uh, it's, that's the highest in Europe, in fact, in terms of total tax burden, other than Denmark. Uh, labor reform has always been a really touchy to um, topic in French politics. It's the third rail of French politics. Anytime a politician tries to deal with the difficulties in hiring and firing uh, lab workers in the private sector in France, they get a lot of backlash and lose their support. Uh, the most recent example of that is the Yellow Vest movement and its reaction to Macron's attempts to reform the labor market. They also have a problem with what I call culturally ingrained cynicism. And I think it's this ethos of like, I'm just like, the best days are behind me. There's no point in life. It's just a nihilism that is just so ingrained in French society. I noticed this when I talked to local French people during my travels there. And you could see it just also in the like the intellectual 
leaders of French philosophy in the 20th century. These include people such as Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, John Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Simon de Beauvoir, John Francois Lyotard, and John Baudrillard. And a lot of their work really had in common was just this nihilism of life being meaningless. It's all absurd. Just enjoy the now YOLO. Don't real. There's really nothing greater that you really need to strive for. No greater purpose. And it started as something that this attitude has been actually probably popular among the intellectual class in France since the Enlightenment. But really, these post World War II philosophers made it more mainstream, and it's kind of seeped into French culture in a way that I think has really hurt their society. Uh, France has a particularly high depression rate. Uh, there is some studies out there that I'm going to link that show that French are the world's most pessimistic people and they have a 70% uh, depression uh, rating, which is also the highest in the world. Uh, they feel like our economy is handicapped by exorbitant taxes and regulation, which I've mentioned. Over half of French people agree with that. And a third of the country, or a little more, 36% believe France lacks a competitive spirit. And I think a lot of it has to do with, again, in, uh, the defeat in World War II, really, and the loss in the, in the Algerian War of Independence, and the Suez Crisis really showed their lack of relevance geopolitically compared to their past. And then the amount of lives lost and trauma caused by the two world wars uh, along with just again the popularity of these cynical 20th century french philosophy is really kind of battered down the people i mean this is just my outside point of view if i have any french viewers who would like to disagree and have something else to say on this i'd love to hear from you but just i think that is kind of why france has not lived up to its potential in the post-World War II era. And let's go into some more statistics to kind of go into how France has been struggling. Like French industry has done real well. As I showed in the previous slide, the CAC 40 had a lot of real world leaders in their industry. The problem is 70% of the revenue from the CAC 40 is not in France, it's from overseas. These are more just multinational companies who just happen to have French ancestry more than being truly French at this point. And that's how they've been able to adapt to compete when your country, your mother country becomes structurally uncompetitive. Uh, France's tax burden is 45.4% of GDP, which is only second to Denmark, as I've mentioned, in terms of the highest tax burden in the OECD, which is the organization of developed countries in the world. Uh, they also have a very high payroll taxes. France's payroll taxes are the highest in the world, over 35% on average, whereas the United States, uh, the employer contribution is below 10% by comparison. And the UK is about that level too. Uh, due to this, as a result, the median Frenchman's take-home pay is less than two thirds of that of the median American, uh, twenty eight thousand USD per year in terms of after tax median income versus fifty two thousand for American. And then the other thing is unemployment. Basically, since the nineteen eighties, France has had structurally high employment at around eight to ten percent. Uh, in a world that you have an extremely tight job market and in the US and in Asia, unemployment rates are well below 4%. And even in many other European countries, the unemployment is historically low. France is remained persistently high. And I think it has to do with just the difficulty of firing bad workers 
and or flexibility in terms of employment. Like France has basically decided we'll have more unemployed people in order to avoid having a precarious underemployed class. And there are consequences to that um, that are positive and negative. Uh, the other sign of France is being an uncompetitive economy is its government spending. Uh, even pre-pandemic, government spending in France has been over half of its GDP since 1990. Uh, would you really call yourself a competitive market economy if the free market is is only about 40% of your economy and most of it is driven by the state. And in France, um, most of that state spending is to social spending. Even though France does have some of the best infrastructure in Europe and they have one of the stronger militaries in Europe, they still, like many of these other countries there, have taken the, the road of social stability and through the strong welfare state versus growth, which was a common choice that countries had to make after World War II. Uh, the twin deficits also are another common theme that we looked at at uncompetitive countries. France's balance of trade is actually pretty stable. It's about break even, which is better than the United States. And they do have, again, quality exports and specialized machinery. In fact, they're other than America, I think they're the world's leading weapon export among OECD countries. And then they also get a lot of capital inflow through tourist receipts too. Uh, however, government de deficits is a different story. Uh, France has really had a government deficit every year since the late 60s. Uh, and it's been trending the wrong way. Um, even pre-pandemic, they couldn't get the deficit under 2%. And unlike a country such as Japan, the U.S., who struggled with this, France doesn't control its own monetary policy. However, with uh, French politicians such as Christine Lagarde now running the ECB, they may not need to. So let's do our comparison that we do in generally with these countries is how they fare against another region of the world or an American state. And the example I use for, it's not a perfect one, but it's, they're very similar in terms of land area. So I'm using France versus Texas. Uh, population wise, uh, France is more than double the population of Texas. It's GDP though is only 50% higher, which means on a per capita basis, Texas is doing a lot better. Uh, land area, they're less than 10% different in size. As you can see in the map, it's Texas is slightly bigger, but they're pretty close. Uh, unemployment, uh, France is at 7.3% right now, and Texas is at 4.2%. Uh, Texas likes to be proud of its Fortune 500 companies, but France beats them in that. They have 31 Fortune 500 companies in France, and the, whereas... Texas has 14 headquartered there. However, if you adjust for the population difference, it's about the same on a per person basis. And then competitive wise, France is even less competitive than Spain, which I did in my last country comparison video. They rank 31st of 45 countries in the EU and close to the bottom of the OECD European countries. Whereas Texas doesn't do as well as I thought it would here, but they rank 11th of the 50 US states in terms of economic competitiveness. Their economies are very different though. And France and Texas in terms of their views on things such as politics and religion are probably about as opposite as you get for developed market economies. However, um, they are kind of both are the second leading state in their sub-region where Texas and the United States, second to California in population and influence. And France, really, in the European Union is second to Germany in terms of population and influence. So, but fun fact, both France and Texas have cities named Paris, 
but of course the French one is a lot more notable in France. You know, Texas has its unique culture. Uh, France kind of knocks it out of the park in terms of cultural sway compared to Texas. But even though these are vastly different places, the fact that they have as many similarities as they do is kind of surprising. Overall, my conclusion really for France is that I go back to the old money family who has kind of let the family business just take care of itself, but their lifestyle has exceeded the income produced by the family business. Can France carry on the way they are going for a while? Yes. Can they do the, what they're doing indefinitely? I doubt it. Uh, they're also lucky that Europe in general has kind of has a similar malaise. And France does have one other advantage that they have a stable birth rate, whereas most of Europe has rapidly declining birth rates. I guess you have more time to raise a family if you're not working. Uh, but let me know your thoughts. Uh, feel free to comment, like, and subscribe. I'm always open to debate. Uh, the comments I've received in the UK edition of this series and the Portuguese edition have been very educational and helpful. And I look forward to the same type of discussion here. Thank you for watching.